thank you, Father, for blessing us one more time with grace, for allowing us to experience your goodness thus far this day. Thank you for keeping us in the palm of your hand, for supplying our needs according to your riches in glory. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We pray, Holy Spirit, for you to meet us and lead us into the truth of your word. May we receive it in understanding and help us to obey it, to apply it, to embrace it as we seek to live by it. We love you because you first loved us. And we pray now that your will be done through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right. So we'll pick up in Galatians chapter 4. And I would like to reread from verse 12 through verse 18 as we revisit um, Paul's plea for the Galatians awakening. Galatians 4 verses 12 through 18 from the New King James Version. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. Amen for the word of our God. All right, so let's resume where we picked, where we left off last time. Um, in verse 15, Paul harkens back to the joy and the happiness the Galatians had upon hearing the gospel. And he asks, what happened to that? Where is it? All right. And there's a possibility in Paul's mind that maybe the Galatians, again, resemble the rocky soil in the parable of the sower Jesus gave in Matthew 13. They received the gospel with joy, immediately it sprang up, had no root. So when hard times came, they fell away. Who knows? Paul is working his absolute hardest to make certain that does not happen to these Galatians. All right. So he remembers how they received his message. They were so enthusiastic about it. All right. And he says, you would have given me your own eyes if that were possible. Now, is this statement related to verse number 13, where Paul talks about his physical infirmity? Is his physical infirmity related to his vision? All right. We don't know. Okay, there is, there is no specificity in the scripture regarding what this particular physical infirmity may have been. So Paul may be making a statement we can take literally. His eyesight may have been so bad that the Galatians, out of a sense of love and empathy and also gratitude for what he had presented to them, maybe some of them would have wanted to trade places with him. Right? And, and, and 
you know, we can relate to that feeling in some respects. You know, for in in being parents, we would gladly trade places with our children when they are suffering and we can't do anything about their suffering. You know, spouses the same. You know, there there are people with whom we have such connection that we would trade places if they were suffering and we weren't, we would take their suffering. So maybe Paul is speaking more in that figurative sense. We don't know. Right? But he says, you all were so receptive of what I shared with you about Jesus Christ, about the gospel, that you would have given me your own eyes. All right. So then Paul says, based on our history, what happened? What, what happened to me in your mind that has led you to believe and conclude I somehow lied to you or deceived you or misled you? Paul is saying, what, you know, what, what happened? Why the change of attitude toward me? You know, he, he, that's what he says. You know, where, where is that sense of gratitude? That sense of being blessed? Where, where did that go? How did that evaporate? Why were other people able to come in after me and completely pull the wool over your eyes? Why were they able to unravel the garment of truth with which I left you? And they, you know, they, they can't really answer that question because they don't know. He says, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And that's something we need to ponder every now and then. Because the sad reality is, sometimes when we tell people the truth, we become their enemies. People don't want to hear the truth. People don't want to be held accountable. Because sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes the truth is hard. And when we tell people the truth, they may resist, they may bristle. And Paul says, you embraced me, you welcomed me. I told you the truth and now you seem to be casting me aside and the message that I shared. Right, so he's wondering what, 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 what was the catalyst of that, all right? Well, these Judaizers, again, Jewish believers or people, Jews who claim to be believers and are telling Gentiles they must be circumcised in order to be saved. They 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 are seeking to invalidate whatever message Paul preached. They want to invalidate the Galatians' salvation, and then compel the Galatians to be as the Judaizers. They 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 want to then lead the Galatians. After unraveling Paul's message of freedom in Christ, they want to lead the Galatians in the principles of their false gospel. So, again, at its core, this is a war about truth. And listen, the entire Christian faith is based on truth 
and we are at war over the truth. Jesus says he is the truth. Jesus says the word of God is truth. The very first sin committed by humankind stemmed from an attack on truth. Serpent said, did God really say that? Is that true what God said? So sin is the result of not believing truth. So this is why the church must be vigilant in upholding and standing on truth. Because if we don't, then there are a bevy of lies waiting to take us down. And people are easily misled by lies. Because lies sound good. And lies are convenient. It's hard living by truth. Because lies tend to bring more instant gratification. Whereas truth demands deferred gratification. All right, and we'll talk more about that later. So these Judaizers, they, they, they want to redefine or reframe the Galatians' idea about salvation. All right, and there in verse 18, Paul talks about zeal. There's nothing wrong with being zealous as long as being zealous is pursuing the right thing. As long as a person's zeal is pointed in the appropriate direction, there is nothing wrong with zeal. One of the greatest examples of zeal in the wrong direction and then in the right direction is the Apostle Paul. Again, as he said in chapter one, he persecuted the church. He killed and jailed Christians. He said, I was a murderer and a blasphemer. I was a bad dude. But God had mercy on me. And so the same zeal Paul used to try to destroy the church, as he said, he used to build the church, to spread the gospel, to expand the kingdom. All right, so he used his zeal for God's glory, pointed in the right direction. Verses 19 through 31 to end the chapter. I'll read them. I'm going to read from the King James Version this time. I'll read these 13 verses. Galatians 4, beginning with verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, or Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. and answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. 
for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. All right. And we're not going to go into too much detail. All right. With, in, with these last 18 verse, excuse me, 13 verses of this fourth chapter. I'm just going to pretty much summarize it. All right. Because that's basically what Paul does. He talks about Abraham's two sons. The bondwoman is Hagar. All right. That's Sarah's maid servant. And the other, the free woman, obviously, is Sarah, Abraham's wife. We know the story. God promising Abraham a son. A son who will come from his body. All right. When God made that promise to Abraham, Abraham was 75 years old. Sarah, 10 years younger. That's the promise God made to Abraham. You will have an heir come from your seed. All right. Well, Ishmael came through Hagar, from Abraham and Hagar. He was the result of Abraham and Sarah's impatience in the flesh. Some 11 years after God made the promise, Sarah said to Abraham, I don't think God is going to allow me to bear this kid. So why don't you conceive with Hagar? Maybe that's God's will. Abraham agreed. He and Hagar conceived Ishmael. But God told Abraham, no, Ishmael is not the one I had in mind. And notice, again, just a side note, despite Abraham's decision to try to help God fulfill what God said God was going to do, in that respect, Abraham's actions did not negate God's promise. Why? Because the promise was not based on anything Abraham did or did not do. The promise of a son, of a seed, was unconditional. And God bound himself to himself so he had to do what he vowed he would do. Again, that's what faith is. Believing and trusting God to do what he said. But after 11 years, Sarah and Abraham grew impatient. They tried a shortcut. God said, nope, that's not what I have in mind. Now you got to deal with the consequences, the, the natural consequences of what you did. But my promise remains intact. So Isaac comes. He's the result of their patience. Their patience to allow God to fulfill his promise. And Isaac came 13 years after Ishmael. So. He promised at 75. God promised when Abraham was 75. Isaac, the fulfillment of God's promise, didn't come until 24 years passed. And you think you've been waiting on God for a long time. 
And maybe you have. I'm not trying to say you weren't or that you aren't. But for 24 years, Sarah with a barren wound, as scripture says, and God had to reiterate to Abraham and to Sarah, I'm going to bring a child through Sarah's womb. And that's why Sarah laughed. That's why they named their child laughter. That's what Isaac means in Hebrew, laughter, or he who laughs, she who laughs. God kept his word, kept his promise. Didn't tell them how long it would take, but he kept his promise. So no matter how long, how much time passes, God remains faithful. We think of what Peter says in his second epistle. A thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years to God. God has all the time in the world. And I mean that literally. He has all the time that is in the world. So Ishmael comes by fleshly impulse of impatience, Isaac comes based on the promise and patience to wait for its fulfillment. That's the difference Paul is raising here. So the law produces children of flesh. And he's using, again, this metaphor, Ishmael and Isaac, as a metaphor of freedom in Christ and bondage in the law. Ishmael is representative of bondage. Isaac represents freedom. The law can only be done in the flesh. But the promise is done by the Spirit. So since the law produces children of the flesh and the spirit produces children of promise, they are at odds. Law, spirit, they are at odds. And we see that with Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael gave Isaac a hard time. And Sarah wasn't having it. So Sarah tells Abraham, um, she got to go. Yeah. I, I'm not nearly concerned with where she goes, but um, yeah, no, she can't stay here. And her son got to go with her. So Abraham tells them you know, they had to leave because Sarah, she didn't want, she, she was not going to have her son. The son God promised them, the son for whom they waited nearly 25 years as the one God promised, she was not going to allow Ishmael to have a piece of the inheritance God promised for Isaac. She was not going to let Ishmael disrupt or destroy the promise God made to her and her husband. All right. She knew she didn't want Ishmael causing problems, terrorizing her kids. So she cast them out. And we see this story unfold in Genesis 13. Excuse me, Genesis 16, going through Genesis chapter 21. She got rid of them. So those of us who are born of the spirit, we are the children of freedom. We are the children of promise. That's what Paul says in verse 28. We're born from above the Holy Spirit. 
Now, if you look at John 3, 16, if we believe in Jesus Christ, that means we are born from above. Jesus tells Nicodemus that earlier in that chapter. Except one be born of the spirit or born from above, he cannot enter into the kingdom. How do we get to believe in Jesus? We get to believe in Jesus to inherit that everlasting life by being reborn, rebirthed from above, from the Holy Spirit. He makes us children born in freedom, born from one who is free. Obviously, God is free. All right. Let's move into chapter five. And I'm going to read first 12 verses of chapter five. I'm going to read them from the New American Standard Bible. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you? from obeying the truth. This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. The word of the Lord. Pretty strong language from the apostle. But here he describes the uselessness of returning to the law, and, and it's costly, all right? So in verse one, Paul once again reinforces emphatically, the Galatians have been set free from any obligation to the law by Jesus Christ. So he tells them, he orders them, to stay in that freedom, to stay in that freedom. All right, now I'm going to I'm going to flip that principle to its opposite side by using our current situation as an example, as an illustration. We've been shut up in our homes, and we are. are hearing of spikes in the virus. Why? Because people yearn for freedom and that yearning for freedom has led many people to go out and now we're seeing and hearing about more cases of the virus. Well, had people stayed put, then it would have been better off for them. And that's, again, in general. And that's the opposite. 
the mirror image, if you will. Paul is saying, you've been freed, stay free. Don't go backward into bondage. You being being in bondage is bad for you. Being free or being in freedom is good for you. Why would you go back to bondage? Again, a question he has raised a few times in a few different ways. All right. So he says, don't go back to that yoke that entangled you, that tied you down. All right. Now, I want to show a video. Before I show it, I want everyone to know this story ends well. Okay? It ends well. But I thought about what Paul said about going back into something that entangles. All right? Now we see here there's a deer and he's tangled up in rope and some kind of wire. So this man and his female partner are trying to set this deer free from bondage. Right now, they've, they've, they've got the proper equipment and tools to set the deer free. Now the deer is kind of cooperating and kind of not. All right? But he's tangled up. Can't get free. So they're working hard to free this deer. I'll fast forward just a little bit. And he's almost free from this bondage. They're almost there. He's getting impatient. Still kind of tangled up. And still not quite free and not cooperating very much with the person trying to set him free. But eventually, uh oh, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Let's get to the end. He gets free and he runs away from that which had him in bondage. And that's what Paul is saying. You've been set free. Why do you want to go backward? All right. Circumcision is a return to bondage, to entanglement in the law. And Paul is saying, eh, don't go back. Because if you go back, you forfeit your freedom in Christ. And your freedom costs Christ his life. So going back is expensive. All right. And that's why Paul, he says, if you go back, if you are circumcised, that means you're returning to the law. And if you go back in that one part, you obligate yourself to fulfilling all of the law. And no one can fulfill all the No one can. All right, right. In James chapter 2, verse 10, James says, if you break one part of the law, you are guilty of breaking the whole law. So why put ourselves under that kind of pressure, that kind of burden, knowing we cannot sustain it? That's what Paul is saying. To the Galatians. In verse 4, he, he, he uses the term 
falling from grace. All right. And that basically means someone has rejected the righteousness of Jesus Christ that leads to salvation and instead are pursuing self-righteousness. In other words, they have grace. They have been exposed to grace. They reject that grace and are now pursuing self-righteousness. And again, that, that's futile. Because as Paul has said here in Galatians, as he says in Rome, or in the letter to the Roman church, by the works of the flesh shall no one be justified. All right. So when Paul talks about falling from grace, he is not saying Galatians had fallen. All right. He's not saying that, that was their current condition. He's saying that would be their condition if they turn back to the law, all right? So he's not pronouncing them as apostates or people who have rejected Christ. What he's saying is they are in danger of becoming apostates, all right? Big difference, big difference, all right? So Paul talks more about this faith, verses five and six. Our faith sustains us. Our faith guards us. Our faith carries us. We have hope born of faith. And we love because of faith. Without that faith connection through Christ to the Father, we would have no hope. Without that faith connection through Christ to the Father, we couldn't love. Because those are two aspects or two benefits that come by virtue of being saved. The only people who can love like God are the daughters and sons of God. Why? Because God indwells us by his spirit. So he empowers us to love like him. So our faith sustains us, all right? And in terms of our salvation, whether we are circumcised or not is irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Again, we think about what Paul said in chapter three, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. The Jews were circumcised, the Greeks were uncircumcised. When it comes to salvation, circumcision does not matter, has absolutely no importance, no bearing, no weight, none of that. People who are circumcised are saved in the exact same manner as those who are not circumcised. That's a repeat. All right. so. Getting to verse 7, Paul says, you all started well in the truth. You got off to a good start. You got off to a great start. You, were, you received the truth. You embraced it. You celebrated the truth. You were walking in truth. You were loving truth. And somehow someone put an obstacle, a hindrance in your path. Somebody did it. All right? And that word... Some manuscripts, some Greek manuscripts show the word encopto. Other manuscripts show the Greek word anacopto. All right. But encopto means to cut into. Right. Someone broke up the road in front of you so you couldn't pass it. Now, those of you who live in Chicago, this image should be familiar. That's Meg's Field. Right after Mayor Daley ordered it to be broken up. So now, small aircraft cannot land on this strip. 
because it's been broken up. All those X's are concrete that has been broken up. And if a plane tries to land on that strip, the pilot would tear the plane to piece, pieces because the path has been broken up. Those are hindrances. All right. And Paul says, someone has done that to you. Someone has broken up your ground on your path of walking in truth. All right. He says, listen, Christ didn't do that. He called you into salvation. He's not leading you away from that truth. That's what verse number eight says. This persuasion did not come from the one who calls you. Christ is calling you. So Christ is not going to call you into truth and then lead you away from truth. And Paul has some concern because he knows one step backward makes the second step easier to take. And one step backward into a law-based righteousness ruins all of the work Jesus Christ accomplished. So we think about what Jesus said on the cross to his father. It is finished. When something is finished, nothing else need be added to it. Nothing need be taken away from it. It is complete. It has been brought to its end. And Paul is saying, if you step back into the law to try to save yourself or produce enough righteousness that God will save you, then you have completely undone everything Christ did and finished. You know what? We'll stop there. We'll stop there. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your love and your grace. Thank you again for your word. Thank you for reminding us that in Christ, we have complete total sufficiency of our salvation. We thank you for what he did for us. We can never do for ourselves. May we walk in freedom and remain in freedom and help us to discern when people try to take us off that path, may we hold on and cling to truth according to your will and by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.